Suppose, for example, that the city of Sparta were to become deserted and that only the temples and foundations of the buildings remained. I think that future generations would, as time passed, find it very difficult to believe that the place had really been as powerful as it was represented to be. Thucydides. Hello, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, Episode 8, The Sons of Heracles. We are now starting to approach the classical period, but first we need to set up our major players in Greek affairs, the Spartans, the Athenians, and the Persians. We will look at the origins of these city-states, their development to just before the classical period, and the institutions that came to define them. Now I mentioned the Persians, and you may say, they aren't Greek. True, but they will play a major part in Greek affairs and our story in the future episodes. So understanding their background will be very helpful. My plan is to devote two episodes to each of our major players before we pick up the story leading into the Persian Wars, just before the Classical period. These episodes will also provide a lot of context to what was happening in the Archaic period, as well as what made a Spartan a Spartan and an Athenian an Athenian. But don't worry, we will be talking about the other city-states along the way as they enter our story. It's just that much more has come down to us about the Spartans and Athenians. With the rise of the powerful city-states, we also have many more written sources to work with, as it became important to record and remember the traditions and the origins of one's own polis, as they grew in size and power. The early periods of Spartan and Athenian history don't have many contemporary written sources, but the late archaic and classical periods see many accounts emerge, to where we are able to still read the surviving ones today. So enough of the plan, and let's get into the episode. When one thinks of ancient Greece, images of the Parthenon in Athens are probably what first come to mind to most. The ideas of democracy and philosophy probably also quickly come to mind. But there was one Greek city-state that developed very differently to most others in the Greek world. They would be based on a monarchy, they would be militarily focused, where individualism was brutally quashed. Even their system of slavery was at odds with the rest of the Greek world. With slavery being a common practice throughout Greece, people who were slaves were not Greek themselves. In Sparta, the slave class, or helots as they were called, were almost all of Greek origin, which had become an essential element in the Spartan economy. With the hindsight of today, it would appear that some of the systems would have provided inspiration to the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century, though adopting only those elements that suited. To be Spartan was to devote oneself to Sparta. The state was your family. You would not bother with farming or trade, your role was to be a soldier, and the Spartan hoplite and the phalanx would become to be known as the best fighting unit in the Greek world. During the Greco-Persian Wars, Herodotus in his histories has the exiled Spartan king, Demaratus, responding to King Xerxes of Persia in relation to the abilities of the Spartan warrior. Fighting together, they are the best soldiers in the world. For a Spartan to turn and run in battle would be of the greatest disgrace, to die in the phalanx holding your ground the most honourable. This was perfectly echoed in the words Plutarch the biographer tells us of what mothers would say to their sons as they left for war. Come back with your shield or on it. To be Spartan was to be famously short, terse and dry in one speech, or as we call it today, laconic, which comes from the word Laconia, the region in Greece where Sparta is. Just before the Battle of Thermopylae, a Spartan soldier being told that the Persian arrows would hide the sun is to have responded we shall have our battle in the shade then. For these episodes on Sparta, we will start looking at the development and creation of Sparta as a physical state. Then we will take a brief look at some of the institutions that were seen as distinctly Spartan in this first episode. Then in the next episode, we will turn to the developments politically and look at the institutions in a little more detail that emerged and would define Sparta. So let us go back to the Bronze Age and start looking forward to see how Sparta developed and how the ideas and events would shape them over the generations to arrive at a point where what I've briefly described would become synonymous with being Spartan. In the region of Laconia on the Peloponnese, it is estimated that hundreds of settlements existed in the Bronze Age. In this area was the Eurotus River Valley and its alluvial plains perfect for growing of crops. In a land where mountain ranges dominated and plains were few and far between, this would explain why so many settlements came to populate the area. Although the ancient site of Sparta doesn't show any signs of settlement until the early Iron Age, around 1000 BC, 
There were other sites, not far, that existed in the Bronze Age to where people would be known as Lacedaemonians, which was also another name the Spartans would be known as, perhaps to connect themselves to the earlier heritage. The name Lacedaemonian was being used at least early as the Late Bronze Age, as some Linear B tablets that were discovered at Thebes, a city-state in the region of Boeotia, used the name. Although many settlements existed in Laconia, there hasn't been any palace complexes that have been uncovered that date to the Bronze Age in the region. This would suggest that the region wouldn't have existed as its own power centre, like what is suggested in Homer's Iliad. It may be that the region of Laconia was a later name used to describe the geographical area that we are familiar with now. It may be possible that the great palaces on the Peloponnese, such as Mycenae and Pylos, may have exerted influence into the area so that the area would not be seen as its own region, but a part of others. In the Iliad, King Agamemnon of Mycenae's brother, Menelaus, was the king of Sparta. The Iliad was probably put down in text around 700 BC, but its origins stretch further back to perhaps the Bronze Age itself, or just as it collapsed. The royal connection in the poem may have come about due to the development and rise in Sparta's importance after the Bronze Age, or it could have been a matter of a royal family spreading its influence out and gaining control over a region with fertile lands but using later settlement names to make those connections. Though it is very hard to try and draw any conclusions based on a text that is essentially an intertwined mashup of fictional and historical elements, so it seems Sparta the settlement and the people cannot be found in the archaeological record till the early Iron Age. So where did they come from, and how and why did Sparta become a settlement? In a previous episode, we have talked about the Dorian invasion and the migrations that were possibly taking place in the past. The Dorian invasion is what we are interested in for this episode, as the Spartans identified themselves as Dorians, and the idea of Dorians moving into the Peloponnese is at the core of the traditional foundation of Sparta. The concept of a Dorian invasion was created by historians, which draws upon the Greek legend to do with an event known as the Return of the Heraclidae, which we'll look at soon. It is probably helpful here to understand what we are talking about when referring to a Dorian. In Greece, there were a number of different groups that people tended to be part of, and would be associated with different regions. They were Aeolians, Achaeans, Ionians, and Dorians. These were roughly speaking, the different ethnic groups or tribes within Greece. Though the easiest way to distinguish these groups was the dialect of Greek that they spoke. The names of the different groups all come from the sons and grandsons of Helen, who were seen in mythology as the ancestor or originator of the Greeks or Hellenes. The Spartans weren't the only people that were known as Dorians. In the classical period, this common ancestral connection was also considered to be shared by the city-state of Corinth, many cities on Crete, Syracuse and Halicarnassus in Asia Minor, as well as many other areas. This shows that the groups were not concentrated in one particular area, but were spread out all over the Greek world not just the geographical area of Greece. In our episode on the collapse of the Mycenaeans, we looked at the likelihood of a Dorian invasion as a possible explanation to the collapse. As we discussed, it seemed that from the evidence available, this was unlikely, but this theory is also an explanation of how the Dorians, and by extension, the Spartans, came to settle the Peloponnese. Just to recap, the basic theory has the Dorians moving down from the north, possibly pushed out by others, such as the Sea Peoples, and then eventually coming to resettle in the Peloponnese. This is supposed to explain their appearance throughout the Peloponnese, and also the sudden collapse of the Mycenaean palaces due to the huge numbers moving throughout the lands. This theory has been floating around for some 200 years, but has never been proven one way or the other, definitively. Though the current evidence shows that this theory is probably unlikely due to the reasons we went through last time, which can be summed up with the fact that around 1200 BC, the Mycenaean world collapsed but there doesn't appear to be any sign of any new culture such as the Dorians replacing the Mycenaeans, which would be expected with a large body of invaders arriving and conquering a region. We only see a gradual change over a couple of centuries, and we only see the settlement of Sparta appearing around 1000 BC. So if it looks unlikely that a marauding group of people conquered the Mycenaeans and established themselves in their place, how did the Dorians come to dominate the Peloponnese? This has been part of an ongoing debate ever since the Dorian invasion hypothesis was put forward some 200 years ago. The invasion theory had been popular for most of this time, but from the 1970s onwards it has become less supported by historians, as new evidence has come to light. As we have discussed before, the archaeological evidence points to a migration over time, people moving from the north of Greece into central Greece 
and some finally making their way into the Peloponnese. The Peloponnese didn't experience a sudden cultural or artistic change, which would be expected from a sudden large influx of dominant newcomers. What is now more widely accepted is that this migration of people took place over many generations, settling in some areas and being pushed out in others, to where groups ended up filtering down into the Peloponnese. And after some time, they were able to establish themselves over the native populations in many areas. So perhaps we can think of the Dorian invasion as more of a migration, though again nothing definitive can be proven as yet, and more evidence needs to come to light before that can happen. But let's now turn to how the Greeks believe the Dorians came to inhabit the Peloponnese. The legend that the Spartans point to as the legitimacy to Laconia as their traditional homeland is what is known as the return of the Heraclidae. The Heraclidae were the ancestors of the hero Heracles, who in mythology undertook the twelve labours. Heracles was supposed to be half god, as his father was Zeus, who had an affair with the mortal woman behind the back of his wife, the goddess Hera. After his twelve labours, Heracles immolated himself and joined the Olympic pantheon. During his adventures he had encounters with many women, who as a result bore children with Heracles as their father. There are many different genealogies given by ancient writers that differ, but for our purposes we will just accept that there were a number of descendants of Heracles out there. Heracles was born into the house of Perseus, who had their roots in Argos, which is on the Peloponnese, and Zeus had intended that he would become king there. Hera, Zeus's wife, through her cunning, ensured that Argos would come under the control of the king of Mycenae. It's worthwhile to note here that Hera, knowing of Zeus's affair, was extremely jealous and she had set many dangers against Heracles. From birth onwards, Heracles was able to defeat all that was sent against him. In fact, Heracles' name basically means glory through Hera. Once Heracles had died, his descendants were exiled from the Peloponnese and would eventually find refuge in Athens. Many attempts would be made with the Heraclidae trying to move back into the Peloponnese. The first coming not long after Athens was attacked by the Mycenaean king for not giving up the refugees. The attack failed and the king was killed to where the descendants then attempted to return. Though after a year they were once again forced out of the Peloponnese. There would be more attempts made by future generations that would also be unsuccessful, even though they had consulted the Oracle of Delphi, a step crucial when undertaking matters of great importance. Another attempt was now made and the oracle was once again consulted to where the same advice was given. This generation of descendants then reproached the god for advice that had failed in the past attempts, to where Apollo informed them that they had misunderstood the oracle previously, which was a common occurrence with men trying to understand the cryptic words spoken at Delphi. The previous generations had been told to set out on their campaign on the third crop and travel by the narrow of the seas. The crops referred to were not the years or seasons, but rather meant generations of men. Now armed with this insight, the Heraclides arranged for another campaign, but this time the expedition was foiled by storms wrecking the fleet and famine. Apparently the failure this time was due to a divine intervention as a crime of sacrilege had been committed by another descendant. The Heraclides then made things right by the gods by banishing the member who had performed this sacrilege, and then another expedition was arranged by the next generation and this time it would be successful. The Heraclidae now held the Peloponnese, with the surviving leaders dividing up the lands by lot between themselves. This is the outline of the myth that the Spartans point to as the Dorian's legitimate rule over the Peloponnese. The accounts we have that make up this story are in fact a little convoluted and leave questions open. The chronology of the invasions and a number of them differ with different ancient accounts. Also, it is very interesting that many of the descendants that are named and act as leaders, are not themselves Dorians, although they formed connections with the Dorian leaders in one way or another. Now that we have our newcomers, or newcomers by generational terms in the Peloponnese, and with the Greek world now starting to emerge from the Dark Ages, the conditions were now present for societies to start expanding beyond their small clusters of dwellings. Settlements would merge into larger ones as communities developed, which is what happened when Sparta was created. As we have said, there hasn't been any remains uncovered at the site of Sparta itself until around 1000 BC, which would elude its glorious past, as indicated by Homer in the Iliad. Though the settlements that would merge together to form the city of Sparta show signs of buildings and remains that date to the Mycenaean times. Sparta would emerge from the union of four villages that were in close proximity to each other 
Then it is thought around the mid 800s BC, after the creation and consolidation, Sparta then expanded once again, this time to the south, to include a fifth settlement. Now Sparta controlled the majority of the Eurotas Valley and its surrounds, though some hundred years later, this territory that now made up Sparta was not enough, and expansion would continue. The Spartans now had their eyes on the region of Messenia, though a large natural barrier stood between them, known as the Tigetus mountain chain, which rose to 2,400 metres at its peak. The region of Messenia was perfect for raising crops, and most likely this is why Sparta's interest was fixated on this region, as well as possibly the effects of overpopulation being felt at Sparta, like a lot of settlements emerging from the Dark Ages. As we will see, this region would become the most important area economically for Sparta, and would continue to be for centuries to come. The chronology and specifics of the campaign against Messenia are difficult to know for certain, as only fragments survive from a poet named Tertius, who is thought to have been active in the area of Sparta in the late 7th century BC. Another writer, Pausanias, also relates some information on the campaign, though he wrote in the 2nd century AD. From what we know related by the writers, it seems that the campaign, which is known as the First Messenian War, began somewhere from the mid to late 700 BCs, and lasted 19 years. It's thought that the war began as a series of border raids and skirmishes, rather than a full-scale invasion of disciplined phalanxes of Spartan hoplites which their name would become synonymous with later in history. Eventually the region of Messenia was under Spartan control, and the inhabitants were reduced to a peasant class status and continued to work the same lands, but instead for themselves, their work now benefited their new masters, the Spartans. This new class of slaves would be known as the Helots, and the Messenians were not the first or last population to be subjugated to the status by the Spartans. It is thought that this system of slavery was first set up before the campaign into Messenia, meaning that groups of people in the Laconian region were relegated to a slave status in Sparta's early expansions. Some 40 years later, the Spartans and Messenians engaged again in the Second Messenian War, which was to last around 20 years. This time the Messenian helots initiated the war by revolt and invaded Spartan territory in an attempt to regain their freedom. The Messenians this time around had support from the polis of Argos, which was located northeast of Sparta. The first battle of the war, the Battle of Deras, was fought before the allies of either side could become involved, and its result was highly disputed with no clear victor. Though the result of the battle was enough for the Messenians to offer the man who led them, Aristomenes, the kingship of Messenia. Aristomenes refused the offer and instead continued to lead the revolt as a general with absolute power. The Messenians were able to follow up the battle by placing a shield in the temple of Athena, which was sacred to the Spartans, causing them much concern. The Spartans then sent off a delegation to the Delphic Oracle for advice from Apollo, which they received the instruction to gain an ally from Athens. Supposedly Athens sent the lame poet Tertius to help, not wanting to disobey the Oracle, but also not wanting to send any real help. The next battle the two sides engaged in was at a place called Boar's Grave, and saw the Messenians being victorious over the Spartans. Though after this the Spartans were able to use bribery to gain the upper hand in their next encounter. Once the Spartans advanced on the Messenian lines, the allies of the Messenians retreated, which forced the Messenians to quit the field and seek shelter behind the walls of a fortified city at Mount Aria. Held up in their fortified position, raids on the surrounding towns were conducted, where in one raid Aristomenes was captured, but was able to escape before he could be executed. The Messenians were able to remain held up in their fortified position for another 10 years before a final Spartan attack ended their defence. Spartans were then able to quell the revolts, which had continued once the commander of the Agrees was killed. They were then able to relegate the Messenians back to the status of helots. The Spartans, as they were expanding, were also attracting attention from other city-states on the rise. Argos to the east of Sparta seemed to have been actively trying to check Sparta's growth, as seen by the support of the Messenians. This support may have also led to the first direct battle that we hear about between the Spartans and Argos, which would inflame their enmity towards each other for generations to come. What took place was the Battle of Hisiae, a village just inside the aggrieved territory. Hardly anything else is known about the battle except that Argos defeated the Spartans, convincingly. Also, it is thought that the battle took place around 669 or 668 BC, which puts it around the end of the Messenian War or during its closing stages. It is thought that the Spartans were the aggressors as the battle took place just inside aggrieved territory, 
possibly being a response to Argos's aid to the Messenians during the Second Messenian War. With their defeat at Hesea, the Spartans are thought to have engaged in a program of reforming their military, which saw their hoplite force adopting the phalanx formation that we spoke about last episode. During the early history of Sparta, it can be seen that they were developing very differently socially and politically to most other city-states. Though they were still Greek, linked through common language, religion and culture. To finish off this episode, I want to just briefly look at a few areas where Sparta was already showing how they earned the title of the old man out in Greece. We will expand on some of these areas in our next episode when we look at the Spartan institutions. From the beginning of the formation of the Spartan city-state, they had continued with the system of kingship, like the old Mycenaean times. Many other polices had disbanded with the system, though some others had continued with it or re-established it. What made Sparta's kingship very different to the rest of the Greek world was the fact that they had dual kings, so two men serving as kings at the same time. A few explanations have been put forward to try and explain why the Spartans developed this unique system. Firstly, power would not be tied up with one person, so there would be no absolute ruler and a counterweight to the decisions could exist. Though it must be noted that the Spartan kings between them didn't have all the say in their society either, but we will look at how their constitution was set up next episode. Spartan kings were also the leaders of the military and would accompany the army on campaign. Usually one of the kings would lead the army in the field while the other would remain in Sparta. This would ensure stability at home in the event if one of the kings fell in battle. This would be even more crucial in Sparta's case due to their helot system that they had developed. It has also been suggested that in the early days of Sparta emerging out of the original four settlements, that the two largest put forward their leader each, which may have led to a peaceful union and prevented hostilities from breaking out. As we have seen from previous episodes, the Greeks had set out and colonised many areas around the Mediterranean. This was to deal with the problems of overpopulation and also gain new trade networks to help feed populations on the mainland. Sparta too had set up colonies, but only in a couple of locations. As we can see, their way of dealing with overpopulation and economic issues was to expand their own territory and use the captured population to drive their economy. It's hard to say if this was a conscious policy from the beginning or was adapted to deal with their situation once forming the city-state of Sparta. They may well have found that when they first started enslaving groups of people in the Erodus Valley, sending groups of their own population to establish new colonies far afield would be a dangerous prospect with the constant threat of a revolt at home. Therefore, a strong Spartan citizen body would be needed to ensure peace. One of the largest aspects that set Sparta apart from the rest of the Greek world was their system of slavery. As we have seen from the Mycenaean War, they were in the business of enslaving populations that they had conquered. Although slavery was part of life in all Greek city-states, what set the Spartans apart was the fact that the majority of their slaves, or helot class, were other Greeks, almost unheard of in the other Greek polices. The Spartans were completely reliant on this system of slavery, as it was the helots who drove the agriculture in Sparta, which its citizens relied on. The helot population would greatly outnumber the Spartans, or what the Spartans referred to as Spartiites, who were considered the true legitimate citizens of Sparta. We'll look at this a bit more next episode, when we look at the institutions that came to define Sparta. The last major difference we will cover this episode is how Sparta set itself up upon a militaristic society. In the Greek world, and the rest of the world for that matter, most citizens in the archaic and classical period were artisans, labourers, farmers, held political positions and so on. If war ever broke out, these citizens would then serve in the citizen army as amateur soldiers before returning to their primary role after the war or their service had ended. In Sparta, a citizen's primary role was as a soldier to the state which didn't allow them time to engage in other professions. As we have seen, the labour tasks were left to the helot class and artisan roles to the perioiki, meaning dwellers around. The perioiki were another class within Spartan controlled lands, though unlike the helots, they were free but not full Spartan citizens. It's possible that the Spartans developed this system in response to their experience in the Mycenaean Wars and their earlier expansions, discovering they required a strong, highly trained military to keep their main economic workforce from revolting, who greatly outnumbered the citizen population. Not to mention, a highly trained force would also be needed to prevent any further military defeats, like that at the hands of Argos. In this episode, we have looked at the early beginnings of Sparta, with all the troubles that presents us, due to the lack of literary accounts referring to this period. 
We can see that they began as a small insignificant settlement in the Dark Ages. They grew and incorporated other settlements, which in turn increased their power. Even their control over their geographical area was not enough to prevent overpopulation and economic concerns. But instead of setting out and founding new colonies to the extent that other policies to solve these issues, they turned to expanding their own territory and enslaving their neighbouring regions. With their direction very different to most other city-states that we know of, their social and political systems also began to develop differently, which we briefly looked at. In our next episode, we'll expand on these systems, where we'll also talk about one of the most important figures in the foundation of Sparta, Lycurgus, who may or may not have existed. We will look at the constitution he is credited with introducing into Spartan society. We will also look at other institutions which were part of Spartan society and which gave them their reputation that still survives today. Along the way, we are going to look at some of the key elements during Sparta's advance through the Archaic period, which will take us up to the beginning of the Greek and Persian Wars. Thank you for your continued support. To receive updates and be notified of new episodes, you can subscribe at castingthroughancientgreece.com. You can also follow the series on Facebook, Casting Through Ancient Greece, or on Twitter at Casting Greece. I hope you can join me next time for episode 9, This is Sparta. <laughs>